Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I would like to give you today a sort of an evolutionary perspective on some problems that confront us all today. I especially want to focus on the issue of obesity and its relationship to athleticism. So today, I think a lot of people are pretty pleased about the state of the human species, right? Uh, in the last 100 years, the world's population has expanded by about 5 billion people. There are about 7 billion people almost on the globe today. In the United States over the last 100 years, life expectancy has shot up by about 30 years for an average American. And the average American male is about four inches taller now uh, than he was about 100 years before. So a lot of people think that we've made a lot of progress. And by those measures, indeed, we have. In fact, I think one of the major problems that we suffer from today is that we've made too much progress. And we now suffer an embarrassment of riches. Uh, since I was born, the percentage of Americans who are overweight or obese has increased dramatically. In fact, the percentage of obese Americans has doubled. So now two-thirds of us are either overweight or obese. And in that time period, the prevalence of various diseases of affluence, which are also caused by essentially too much energy, has also doubled. So for example, cancer rates and diabetes. Many other diseases have doubled over the last 40 years. And, and the sad news, what's really scary, is that they're getting worse. And it's particularly scary when we look at our children. 35% of American children are now overweight. And if you look at this graph here that shows children around the world and other countries, that, those, those trend lines are going up too. By the year 2015, the UN estimates that 2 billion people will be overweight. And the, the obesity and overweight cause a, a wide variety of, of diseases of affluence, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, joint disease, and also even uh, psychological diseases like depression and anxiety. So we're in for a very rocky road in the next few generations as we cope with these problems of obesity. So what is our standard response as a society? Well, we just heard a, a talk about technology, and a lot of us really put our faith in technology. And I'm not a technophobe. Um, uh, Joy Adams said today earlier that you know, somebody who worked in her, in her kitchen is not a Luddite. I am not a Luddite. I'm not opposed to technology. But I worry about our over-reliance on technology to solve some of these problems. For example, we are spending billions of dollars on stem cell biology to replace the pancreases that we destroy through bad living. We're, investing billions of dollars in pharmaceuticals. Many Americans, millions of Americans, are now getting gastric uh, bypass surgery and, and, and replacements of joints because our bodies are getting sick because of the way we use our bodies. I'm not opposed to stem cell biology. I'm not opposed to, to pharmaceuticals. I'm not even opposed to gastric surgery. But the problem with all of these treatments is that they treat the symptoms of the problems, not their causes. So people are getting sick, and we invest billions of dollars to patch them up after they're sick. And this is a problem that we're going to have to f deal with in, in, in a, an order of magnitude greater degree uh, over the coming years. So, the sad thing is that although we're developing all these wonderful new technologies, we already know how to extend human life. We already know how to enhance the well-being of the body and the well-being of the mind. It's very old-fashioned technology. It's called exercise and diet. Um, you can actually really improve your life substantially through eating a good diet and exercising. I'm not going to talk too much about diet today, but I want, do want to talk a little bit about exercise because a lot of people don't really know just how potent the effects of exercise are on human health. Now, there are many studies. None of them get as much airplay as they ought to. My favorite, because I'm a bit of a runner, is the Stanford Runner Study. So this was started by a guy named Jim Fries at Stanford University in the 1980s. He took over 500 runners who were 50 years old, starting in 1984, and he's compared them to over 400 sedentary controls. Now, these were not overweight people. They were not smokers. They were not drinkers. They were healthy people who are just not very physically active. And he's been following their health outcomes for the last 25 years. And, they, and more than 20 years later, the differences are massive. So if you're a member of the runners group, in a given year now, you have more than 20% lower chance of dying in a given year. 
That's a massive difference in mortality. And if you look at the causes of death, like cancer and heart disease, their rates of death are half those of the controls. Even more importantly, we often sometimes focus on death, but we should also look at disability. So they've also measured your ability, for example, to climb the stairs or do various other tasks, which give your life quality, right? And if you measure their body disability scores, the runners have disability scores that are half those of controls. So put in active, actual terms, their bodies are about 14 years younger than the controls. And I ask my students, which group would you rather be in, uh, in in 50, 60 years? The answer is obvious. And this is just one of many lines of evidence. And this is just one study. It doesn't even include the effects of diet, which are also very important. So I'm not negating the importance of diet. I'm just here today talking about the importance of exercise. So the question we should all ask ourselves is why? Why is this the case? Why is exercise so important? So because very often we work work on the how problems, right? Lots of molecular biologists work on the molecular mechanisms by which this works, and this is not very, this is very important and I'm and, and really the subject of another lecture, but I'm an evolutionary biologist and I want to try to answer that why question. And a very important phrase in my field, uh, uttered by Theodosius Dobzhansky, a great geneticist from the 19, um, from, the, from the after the World War II, was that nothing in biology makes light, uh, it makes sense except in the light of evolution. And so I'd like to argue that we evolved to be endurance athletes, and because we evolved to be endurance athletes, our bodies are so fundamentally adapted to exercise that if you remove exercise from our environment, and look at all you folks, right? Like me, today, you're all just sitting, right? That's, you, you and I are doing something profoundly abnormal from a human evolutionary perspective. Just spending an entire day sitting in a chair, looking at a TV screen, or listening to other people go on and on and on. So how did we get to this very strange state? Well, the story starts about six million years ago when we diverged from our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, in a forest somewhere in Africa. And so our ancestor that we share with chimpanzees was probably a chimpanzee-like creature, was probably a knuckle walker, ate fruit, uh, lived a kind of chimpy life out there in a forest somewhere. But this was a period of major climate change. So this is a graph of the Earth's climate over the last 30 million years. And you can see there was this massive cooling event which started occurring around the time that we diverged from the other apes. And so our very first hominid ancestors were basically living at the margins of forests which were suddenly turning into woodlands. Now you're a chimp, right? What do you like to eat? You love to eat fruit. But fruits grow in forests. And if the forest disappears, you suddenly now have to go much further on a given day to get the kind of fruit you need in order to, 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 to feed your body. So our ancestors solved this problem in a very strange way by becoming bipeds. And there are two big advantages of being bipeds. The first is that it kind of helps you pluck fruit from a tree. But from my perspective, the thing that's even more important is that we actually are very efficient. You spend 75% less energy to schlep a kilo of your body, a kilometer, than a chimpanzee does. So a chimpanzee typically walks about two to three kilometers a day. For the same amount of energy, you can walk eight to 12 kilometers. What enormous advantage if the food is now suddenly dispersed over long distances. But the cost was that we became unsteady, right? It's better to have four legs than two, as Orwell reminds us. But also, we became slow. We lost the ability to gallop. So we became pathetically slow compared to other creatures. But it was a good solution, right? So for millions of years, our ancestors, called the Australopiths, did just fine. So they were climbing trees, and they were walking around, and they were eating fruits and tubers and nuts and seeds, and kind of living kind of nice, sort of decent hominid sort of lives back in, the, uh, in Africa. And then climate change struck again. And this occurred starting around 2.8 million years ago when there was an, this is the, really the onset of the Ice Age. And Africa began to start drying again considerably. And that's when we get the expansion of these big open grassland habitats. So Africa started becoming open and more dry. And our ancestors were living in these habitats. And if you're a Homo erectus sitting around there wondering what you're going to eat for dinner, all of a sudden the fruits are gone, right? All the nuts and seeds are gone. What are you going to eat? Well, there were two solutions. One solution was a group of critters called the robust Australopiths, which basically became low quality food eaters. But our ancestors were the first members of the genus Homo, and we went for the good stuff. We became high quality food specialists, and we, and we invented essentially hunting and gathering. And what does that involve? Well, it involves tools. So the very oldest stone tools appear then. We know it involved lots of cooperation and food sharing, which is something that we excel at now that other animals don't do. But importantly, it involved gathering a wide range of plants as well as hunting. 
You cannot make this system work without an incorporation of meat in the diet. And we know from ancient bones that are 2.6 million years old that people were opening these bones, cutting meat off them, getting the marrow out of them. And to do that, to do that hunting and to do that gathering, we had to become mobile. Your typical hunter-gatherer today walks between 9 and 15 kilometers every single day of his or her life. That's every single day. There's no Sabbath. You do that when you're young, you do that when you're middle-aged, and you do that when you're old until you die. You, the, the, the job description of a hunter-gatherer is to be an endurance athlete. So I'm going to focus just on the hunting part, not that the gathering part isn't interesting, but I'm interested in hunting because hunting is an interesting quandary because how did our ancestors hunt? The world's fastest man in the world today is Usain Bolt. Now he trains nonstop. He's got amazing legs, incredible physique. He's put an enormous amount of effort. He can run a little bit faster than 10 meters a second for about 10 to 20 seconds, and that's it. He's out of gas. Any antelope out there that you would have wanted to chase, or if any of you go on safari and you get the desire to chase an antelope out there, run out of the Jeep, will run twice as fast as Bolt can run and for about four minutes. For that matter, the animals that want to eat you, like a lion, can also run at about 20 to 25 meters a second for four minutes. Hussein Bolt would have no chance of either getting an antelope or saving himself from being eaten by a lion. We are pathetically slow. So we couldn't have gotten our, our prey by chasing with them, after sprinting after them. So a lot of us assume it must have been technology. But you know, the bow and arrow was invented less than 100,000 years ago. And just putting a pointed stone point you know, on the end of a spear, that was actually invented less than 300,000 years ago. So for millions of years, your ancestors and my ancestors hunted with nothing more lethal than a sharpened wooden stick or a club. Now, if you ever decide to get out of your Jeep on a safari and try to kill a wildebeest with a sharpened wooden stick, I suggest you, you think otherwise. You're much, you're much better off as a vegetarian. Okay, so our hypothesis is that this is how we evolved to do what we were so spectacular at, it's endurance running. We're really the world's best long distance endurance runners and it's not just a fluke, it's part of our evolutionary heritage. And it works like this. The first thing is that humans can run at speeds that make animals gallop. Sure, they can gallop much faster than we can sprint, but I'm a middle-aged Harvard professor, right? And I can actually, actually jog at a speed faster than a full-size dog, a dog my body size can trot. So a dog has to gallop to keep up with me. And in fact, I can actually run at a speed that makes a pony gallop. And most good runners can run at speeds that make a, th a thoroughbred horse have to gallop. Now, why is that important? Because when quadrupeds gallop, they overheat. When you run, you sweat. We've lost our fur. We've got sweat glands all over our bodies. We extrude water. We, we evaporate that water. We cool our bodies. But the way the quadruped cools is by panting. <laughs> you know, it's little short, shallow breaths. That cools the animal down. But the problem is that as soon as an animal starts galloping, it's, twist, it's tilting its body back and forth, it's diaphragm, its guts are basically slamming into its diaphragm with every stride. So galloping animals have to entrain every, every breath with each stride and they can cease to learn, uh, they, can cease to, they cease to be able to pant when they gallop. And if you want to do this experiment, take your family dog for a run, make the dog gallop and you'll see the dog can't pant. If you do this for more than 15 minutes on a hot day, however, you may kill the dog, which is not a good idea. Okay, so what this enabled our ancestors to, to do is something called persistence hunting. And it's still practiced. And what you do is you find an animal, a big animal. The bigger the better, because big animals overheat faster than small animals. And you chase it. You make that animal gallop. Of course, it'll sprint away and it'll hide in the bushes and try to cool down, but then you track it. So there's a con and then you chase it again. And if you can keep chasing it, tracking it and chasing it, before it can keep its cool its body temperature down, its body temperature is going to rise and rise and rise. So it's a combination of running and walking, tracking and chasing, and eventually you'll bring the animal, like this kudu here, into a state of hyperthermia. It takes about 15 to 30 kilometers to do this on average on a hot day, but now this hunter-gatherer can walk right up to this guy. He's got a spear, but you can see without any danger, without any serious technology, he can now dispatch this animal. And so before the invention of the bow and arrow, before the invention even of stone points, this was probably one of the ways in which we got dinner. And it explains much about the human body because we are loaded from our heads to our toes with all kinds of features which make us spectacular at running. The reason that all these folks love to run the Boston Marathon is not a fluke. They're not crazy. They're living out their evolutionary heritage. They've got features from their toes to their heads that make us good. We've got long Achilles tendons and short toes and arches in our feet and 
structures in our necks that make us spectacular long-distance endurance runners, and we can see a lot of those features in the fossil record that show up around 1.82 million years ago. So the bottom line is we evolved to be hunter-gatherers. That means walking and running long distances every day, schlepping food home, digging, climbing, carrying food, processing food, life involved exercise day in, day out until very recently. And by the way, hunter-gatherers did not live nasty, short, brutish lives. They actually did pretty well. This is a graph of mortality over time. This is Americans from 2002. These are Swedes from the time of Linnaeus. These are hunter-gatherers and these are 16th century French farmers. And you can see that hunter-gatherers were doing as well as 18th century Swedes. They, if they could survive childhood, they actually lived quite well long into their 50s, 60s, or 70s. So the idea that hunter-gatherers were living lives of poor health is actually untrue. It's the farmers that were leaving lives of poor health. And in fact, that change occurred only recently. Farming was invented less than 600 generations ago in the oldest place. So that means that from, you know, that's, that's the number of generations of dogs that have come and gone since the time of Christ. It's not been very long that we've been farmers, right? And in that time, we've transformed how we get food. And then very recently, we've continued to transform the world so that we no longer have to do any work. Through, through technology like cars and elevators and all those other things. So you can get up today, get a, go to the bathroom, take your car to work, take the elevator up to your floor, or if you're the president of Bata, you don't even have, your, 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 your office is an elevator, sit in a chair all day long and do the reverse process on the way home. Dinner is just an arm's reach in a cabinet. You press a button, voila, you've got dinner, or maybe Jody Adams cooks your dinner for you. But the point is you don't have to do any work whatsoever to live your whole day. And we are paying a price for that because we still have Paleolithic bodies. Again, it's only been 600 generations which, since we began this, this transformation. It's really only been 10 generations since we've been able to stop having to do physical labor. In fact, less than that. And so there's a mismatch between our Paleolithic bodies and the 21st century lifestyles that we're now living. And that's causing, among other things, a crisis of obesity. If you try to estimate or measure how many calories hunter-gatherers get from their diet, they actually eat a pretty sensible, pretty healthy, balanced diet. They get about 1,900 to 2,300 calories a day. And if you measure their physical activity level, which is just the ratio of your energy you're using, your metabolism, relative to the energy you're using when you're asleep, most hunter-gatherers have physical activity levels of about 1.8, which is not so bad. It's not like a Tour de France you know, cyclist who's burning 7,000 calories a day. They're actually burning about 2,000 calories a day, and they're doing just fine. Subsistent farmers are actually about the same. They've got more energy, which they pump into having larger families, but they're basically, their input and their output is about the same. What we've changed recently with industrial food and industrialization is both the input and the output. Americans today, well, it's very hard to get good data on how, much, how many calories people actually eat, but it's, the, the numbers are going up, and there are plenty of people who eat 3,000 calories a day. Um, as, and the other, of course, thing that's, and I, I'm not going to talk about that today, the other thing, of course, that's changed is that lots of people are sedentary. There are a lot of people in this room today, who, on, and my, myself included, who on a typical day will have a physical activity level of about 1.5. That means that you basically aren't doing that much. You're, you're driving to work, you're sitting in a chair all day long, you're, maybe you spend a few minutes in the gym, but that's about it. And that difference, the increased food and the decrease in activity, slowly, over years and years, adds up and leads to obesity. So the point is that exercise used to be compulsory for our survival. You couldn't survive as a hunter-gatherer, not as a young hunter-gatherer, or as a middle-aged hunter-gatherer, or even as an old hunter-gatherer, because grandparents evolved in order for, to, for us as grandparents to help forage and hunt to feed our grandchildren. That's, what, that's why we actually have this long life. That's how net selection uh, 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 selected for long life. But today, of course, we don't have to do that. And the irony is that exercise has become a privilege of the wealthy, right? You need, to have, you need to have a pretty good job to have the time and the money to go to the gym and exer to exercise. Most schools um, 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 don't have a lot of sport, except unless they're sort of fancy uh, private schools. So exercise has become a privilege. And because, so because of our evolutionary history, Vigorous exercise promotes health, and its absence actually causes pathology. So we often talk about how you should exercise, but we don't often talk about how absence of exercise is actually a pathological state from an evolutionary and biological perspective. And it's also true of our mental health. Exercise upregulates dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, which have incredible effects on our mental health 
and when you remove those, you get, you get uh, anxiety and depression and various other problems. And how often when somebody, when somebody has depression goes to a doctor, does the doctor prescribe exercise? We don't bother, we just, we just send them pills. So finally, just to end, I would like to, again, as an evolutionary biologist, ask what we should do. And the problem is that natural selection didn't select us to really love going out and exercising. It might have to some extent, but any hunter-gatherer who's got any sense uh, um, will, will, will stay home on a day when he or she can because it's good to rest when you can. But it wasn't an option for people in the Paleolithic. So, so we like to be lazy. It's part of our nature as much as it is to, to like to eat fat and to eat sugar and to eat salt. So what are our options? Our options really are to try to educate people to exercise more, sort of what I'm doing now, right? We can try to encourage them through various kinds of motivational programs. We can try to empower them. But the fact of the matter is, as the data show, that's not working, right? That alone is insufficient. And so I think the final solution is that we need to think more as a society about requiring people to exercise. And we require our children for example, to learn math and English and learn about technology, why shouldn't we also require them to exercise? And in fact, we do, but only partly. Some of you may be surprised to know that in 1996, the Massachusetts Board of Education actually removed the requirement for physical education from the school curriculum. The Constitution actually still requires it, but the Fit Board of Education doesn't. Participation in school sports has dropped suddenly, causing declines both in not only physical health, but also in mental health. And in fact, less than 35% of high school students get actually more than an hour of exercise in five days a week. So our children are suffering from the, same, from the world that we are creating for them. So I would say that yes, we should continue to invest in technologies to help cure the symptoms of the diseases that we are facing and will continue to face in greater measure. But we also need to change our environments. This is in our own control and we have to decide whether we're going to do it or not. And one is to combat obesogenic foods. Some, may have, some, of, some of you may have read that the Senate just squashed the uh, attempts of the administration to limit the number of potatoes we feed our children today. Do you know that 50% of the vegetables that American children eat is potatoes? And Susan Collins from Maine, who should hang her head in shame, tried to help to defeat this legislation because of the Maine potato lobby. Um, and we're just causing our children to get obese because of this. And then, but the other side of the coin is exercise. And we need to reinvest seriously in exercise. It's the best preventative medicine we have. We cannot rely on people to do it on their own, especially children. We, just like education, we also have to require exercise. So the simplest and most effective solution to our growing problem is that we need to have more exercise, and the fact of the matter is that we have to, it'll probably have to become something that, we, that we, we do actively rather than passively. So let's make children run, and of course, they don't have to wear shoes when they do it either, but that's another story. Thank you. <laughs>